It was great. Thank you, Luciana. And now on to another fantastic project on the topic of resolving urban water shortage issues. I'm delighted to introduce to you Mr. Enrique Lomnitz, co-founder and executive director of La Isla Urbana, who joins us from Mexico City. Thank you. Hey. Hi, good morning. Este, okay. Uh, my name is Enrique Lomnitz. I am the founding director of Isla Urbana. It, we're a project working to develop rainwater harvesting into like a really viable and scalable solution to the kind of water crisis problems that we have in Mexico City. And uh, it's a very ambitious project. Uh, we're a startup operation. We're still in very early phases, but we're really having a lot of very fast growth. And I'd like to begin by telling you a little bit the story of how it all has come together. Um, I'm an industrial designer, uh, or I studied rather, industrial design. And when I studied industrial design, I wanted to work with design for low-income communities. No, it's a kind of uh, demographic that is usually chronically ignored by designers, at least in universities. And I knew that I wanted to work with that. And I also wanted to work with sustainability, which is something that uh, a lot of the people in my generation consider like, to be the, the challenge that corresponds to us to really try and face. So, I'm also from Mexico City, so I wanted to work there. And so I started going to low-income uh, peripheral neighborhoods that were self-built neighborhoods. And I started uh, going to many, many neighborhoods and interviewing people there and just trying to get a sense of what was there and what problems were there that maybe I might be able to provide a solution for through design. And, um, okay. Este, and first of all, I became very, very fascinated by the model of development itself. You know? Design is not always about an end product. It's often about a process. And I really became fascinated with how these neighborhoods came into existence. You know, these are two pictures of, uh, of neighborhoods that I was visiting and neighborhoods that I'm currently working in. And they're informal neighborhoods in that they begin with illegal land grabbings, usually, you no know, squattings or illegal purchases. And then the people start building their houses themselves. And I found it to be a really incredible process because I was asking myself, how do these poor people who don't have access to mortgages, don't have access to credit of any kind, are outside of all of the formal sectors, how do they end up having these you know, permanent, not even so small houses, no? and, and they never have any money? So I started talking to people about this, and I became fascinated with it. And basically what they do is, at the end of the day, whatever few pesos they have left over, they buy some bricks, they buy some laminates, and once they've built up enough of it, they build a room, and then they keep on doing it. Once they've built a little bit more, they add another room, and they kind of build them like coral reefs. No, they kind of build them on each other because they can't save any money because they're all networked together so that if you don't have a job, your, your neighbor feeds your kids, and, and it's all networked that way, so they can't save any money because as soon as they have any little bit of money, it becomes needed by themselves or someone and gets used. So they're putting all of their money into physical infrastructure, even if it's just literally bricks, and, and that's how they grow. And I thought that this was really fascinating. And what was, I think, more fascinating was that this is how they were building their neighborhoods as well, not just their houses, no? So the picture on the, on the right-hand side is a neighborhood called Tecalipac in Xochimilco, and they've done everything. They've paved the streets themselves, um, they've put in all the electricity themselves, they've literally done everything themselves, no? And I thought that that was very interesting. And something that I started noticing in all of these, uh, in all of this research really, is that everywhere I went, people were talking about water. Um, they were talking about water universally as the biggest problem, or at least one of the biggest problems that they were facing, no? And a lot of this you could observe, like this picture on the left, which is right next to where I now live, uh, houses, the houses are full of buckets and little things full of water and full of soapy water and dirty water and clean water and all these different things. And as soon as you see that, you can see that there's a water crisis going on. No, it's very obvious that people are, are very concerned with it. And a lot of people are kind of walking with water and things like that. And that was, that was very interesting to me. But what was more interesting than the fact that there was a water problem even was the fact that the water problem that I observed was behaving differently from the other problems that I was observing. No? So, the infrastructure was being built by the communities themselves in collaboration with the government. No? So for example, um, my neighborhood, when it came time to pave the streets, uh, 
they, the government didn't have enough money to come and pave all the streets. So the people leveled the streets. No, they, they took out the rocks and they made it level. And then the government came with trucks of gravel and asphalt. And then they gave them the tractors and they said, you have until Wednesday to pave the streets because then we're giving the machines to the next neighborhood over. And then the people went and paved all the streets. So there's all these kind of interesting models. And all of the infrastructure was on a progression towards improvement. No, albeit slow. The streets go from being unpaved to being paved to having sidewalks. The electricity, at first there's no electricity, then they're stealing the electricity, then the permanent electricity comes and, and all of the services were improving, no? Uh, except for water. Water was moving the same way. There was no water and they had to carry the water, no? And then they eventually got lines, tap water, one on every block, and that was a lot better. And then they got water in all the houses. And that was like, OK, so now we're OK. And they were getting water maybe three or four days a week. So they just fill all their, all their buckets and all their barrels. And that was good. But about 15 years ago, houses that were getting water three or four times a week are now getting water maybe once a week. No? So it was the only thing. And I was drawing these things on graphs as I was interviewing people. And water was the only one that was starting to decrease. And I started thinking that maybe we were really reaching a point when, when maybe something was different. And I started really looking into how the water situation works in Mexico and really came to the conclusion that we were reaching a point where the system was so unsustainable, and it really is so unsustainable, that we were actually reaching the point when it was failing to sustain itself. No? Uh, and ironically, at the same time, I was like, this is Mexico City. You know, this is a city that used to be a giant lake. It was called the Inland Ocean when the Spanish arrived, a giant lake. And we've spent 400 years trying to drain this lake uh, out into a river Tula and into the ocean. And the lake keeps on wanting to come back. You know, every year we have catastrophic floods um, in all the low-lying parts of the city. Every year we have this, which I love this picture because this is, I think it's Iztapalapa. I'm not sure. It's one of the neighborhoods in the east. It, it's all flooded out with water. It's a combined sewage system, so this water is totally polluted now because it ran through the sewer. Uh, and this guy is bicycling with these water bottles, which is like the water that we're all struggling to have for our own use, no? And this is the very ironic kind of water situation in Mexico. We have scarcity and we're flooding at the same time. And so observing all of this, I said, there has to be a way that we can harvest rainwater in Mexico City. No? I don't know anything about rainwater harvesting, but I'm sure it's not rocket science. I'm sure I can figure it out. And if people are doing it in a bunch of places in the world, then I'm sure we can do it here. And so that's when I started really thinking about rainwater harvesting. And uh, throughout my research, this woman was very, very important to me. Her name is Clara Gaitan. And she's a Mixtecan Indian who migrated to the city as a little girl, like the classic story, uh, came to the city, uh, worked very hard, obtained a little piece of land, illegally, but you know, held on to it and raised her daughter and built her house. And she's now my like, surrogate grandmother or something. And, and she was really amazing to me because she had an incredible consciousness of, of, about water. And she has no education, but we'd stand on her roof and you can see the whole city, no? Because it's up on, the on, on these mountains, like these neighborhoods. You can see the whole city. And she said to me, uh, I don't know where the water comes from in Mexico City, really. But how can this many people be using water and have it not run out? No? And she was very worried about her grandkids. And she was perceiving this correctly. We're on top of a mountain in a valley, and there's somewhere between 20 and 22, 23 million people living there with actually very high water consumption per capita. And, and we really are running out of water. And she kind of perceived that. And so we put a rainwater harvesting system in our house. Um, uh, we, we put it up together with a, a friend of mine, and it transformed her situation. It really did. She went from never having enough water to having more water than she could use for uh, six or seven months out of the year um, with a, a pretty small cistern. And so she was very inspired, and I was very inspired, and so I moved uh, across the street from her and we started putting up rainwater harvesting systems with her neighbors. Um, and from then on, the whole project has been, how do we actually take this thing that started so very modestly with one person and was reached 
very organically, how do we take this and actually make it into something that can scale and grow into everywhere, you know? Uh, Mexico City and, and even beyond in the future. And, and that's really what we've been working on now. And um, basically, p other people started becoming inspired by the project and moving in to live with me. So now we have a, a team of people that are working on there. And we've been working on how to get rainwater harvesting to grow, but in this kind of organic way. No, we're not trying to install all the rainwater harvesting systems in Mexico ourselves. We're trying to catalyze communities to start building their own rainwater harvesting systems. So it's a, a strategy that has many uh, lines working. And in brief, because I really don't have as much time as I'd like, um, this is what they are. First of all, we're, we have to develop effective and accessible rainwater harvesting systems that are adapted to the conditions that we have there, you know? which means they have to be affordable to people, but people also have to like them. It can't be garbage. You know? People have to like them, and they have to provide high quality water and they have to work well. So um, basically what we have in Mexico City, which is fantastic, is that because we have all this intermittent water service and chronic water shortages, people have been building cisterns. So the city has millions of cisterns already built. So we're working on developing rainwater harvesting systems that will connect the roofs that already exist to the cisterns that already exist with a very simple system that will filter, channel, and clean the water on its way in so that when it rains, instead of flooding out our neighborhoods, two million cisterns can fill up in Mexico City. So we need to develop the technology, and we're working on it. This is, a, a pro, our, this is gonna be our first, the Tlaloque, it's gonna be our first industrially produced component. Right now we've been working more artisanally, no? But we're working on that, and so we're working to develop these systems and testing them, and they're working very nicely. Um, the other part is intense, work with the communities, very, very intense work with the communities, constant work with the communities. No, the communities all know that they have this water problem. I mean, we knew that before we started working on this. No, So we go and we tell the people that we're working on this, and the people come and we explain the project to them and we start working together to, uh, to start putting up the systems. So the picture on the right, a community meeting, that's one of my partners, David. Um, we have those maybe seven or eight times a week at least. Uh, all through the periphery of the city. And we also do kind of more artistic work with kids and things like that to really try and just kind of bring people in uh, and include everybody. Um, it's all based on training local plumbers. I mean, the installations themselves. All these neighborhoods are full of plumbers and electricians and all these people that have tons of skills. Um, we want it so that every neighborhood in Mexico City has rainwater harvesting technicians, no? Uh, so the plumbers are also this. And so our... Uh, all of our work really is done through training and employing local plumbers. At this point, we've probably trained 40 or 50 plumbers into rainwater harvesting technicians in southern Mexico City, and some of them are really at a very high level at this point. Um, we work with the community leaders. This is a really very incredibly important part. The, communities are, the community leaders are, are super important characters in pulling the community and organizing the community, and we work very closely with them to, to really have it happen kind of from the ground up. Um, and well, we collaborate with governments, businesses, universities, and other NGOs to do research on water quality, to really develop um, all of the things that need researching, uh, to finance ourselves and the project, to give it publicity and uh, diffusion, I don't know how you say it in English, um, and to test different models of implementation. And, that's where we are right now. Um, we've put up about 1,000 rainwater harvesting systems in the last two years, uh, and, it's, and it's growing. And right now, we're testing several different models. And this is the systems, I mean, just a few of them, uh, and how they look. And I'm about to run out of time, but really the idea here is for every house, for houses in Mexico City, and eventually other places, to have rainwater harvesting systems as part of their basic infrastructure. You know, like the way they have a boiler, or the way they have you know, a gas tank or whatever. And uh, it's about providing the technology and training the people and giving it um, publicity and getting people talking about it in such a way that people eventually start just kind of doing it themselves in a very organic way. And what we're already observing is we go into communities and we put up rainwater harvesting systems and we start seeing, when we come back maybe a month or two later, kind of knockoffs of the systems, no? Like a copy, like pirate, systems and things like that starting to come up. And that's exactly what we're looking for. And so far it's been very successful and, and we're growing and 
I mean, there's very much still a lot to do, but it's a very simple technology. We've been talking about high tech and all these things, and I think that that's very important, but a lot of it is also very low tech stuff, um, but that's intelligently designed, I believe. And smart cities aren't just, you know, apps for your iPhones. It's also a city that is integrated into its hydrological cycles, and that when it rains, the cisterns fill up instead of everything flooding out. And doing it in such a way that, that even people that have very low levels of education, but they're not any stupider than, than people that are educated, they just didn't have access to it, they can really learn how to do this, and they can do it themselves. And we're just trying to kind of catalyze it and get it running. And that's Isla Urbana, and that's what we're doing. And thank you very much. <laughs>